Good morning, Rob Minkoff. Welcome on VH Berries. Good morning. I am very grateful. 2020 uh, is an opportunity for you uh, to have a new kind of windows to let a bird, in your case, a movie, take a flight. Yes, exactly. Although we're, that was, yeah, so 2020 is, has come and gone and now we're in 2021 and it's, it's almost over, shockingly. So you are working on an upcoming movie yes. that is called Blazing Samurai. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. So uh, Blazing Samurai is a film I've been working on for some time, and we've just finished the animation production uh, at a studio in Montreal uh, called Cinesite. Um, and uh, the project started many years ago as a, uh, an idea of taking a film, a very well-known comedy Um, uh, made by Mel Brooks called Blazing Saddles, which many people have seen. Of course, many people have not seen, but um, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was something about the story, uh, which was, you know, at, at the time it was, it was very, uh, uh, it broke a lot of taboos. If you watch the movie today, obviously it's, there are things in it that are quite shocking. Um, but there's something about the story, which is about, um, you know, Uh, ultimately people accepting others despite their differences. And, you know, we, we felt like that was a very contemporary theme and something that actually could work in a contemporary movie. And, and yet turning it into a fable, meaning doing a, telling a story about animals might be a more appropriate way of, of telling a story like that. So in the case of Blazing Samurai, it has become a story about a dog that becomes a samurai in a world of cats. And so, of course, because they're cats and he's a dog, they hate him. Uh, and, you know, don't want to accept him, but will learn to overcome their, uh, their prejudice um, and, 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 you know, embrace him. And so uh, I think there's a great message for, you know, for the world today. Uh, the original film, which was a live action film, in a way is much more, was, was breaking many taboos about race and prejudice. And, you know, uh, actually, I think is, is very well regarded because of that. Although, uh, to a modern sensibility, uh, it, it would, it would be quite shocking. This film, the original film that was made in 1974. Um, but the, but our film is, uh, you know, ha has its own, uh, kind of unique character and unique personality. And, and, you know, it's trying to embrace the, the underlying story you know, in a very different way, you know, in a very, in, in a more accessible way. And what I found very inspiring, Rob Minkoff, is that through the times and the ages, um, it's very popular to use, for example, in animated movies, animals to express stories about our society. The first example that is coming to my mind is Jean de La Fontaine with his fables. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think that's that the, the nature of fables uh, has always been to tell, you know, uniquely human stories, but in the guise of an animal um, for a variety of reasons, obviously, because firstly, I think it, it, it's very relatable to children, mostly. Uh, and, and plus, we can see deeper truths in the stories of animals and don't get caught up in our own prejudice. So you mean that you are uh, trying to, of course, and obviously, send messages um, into your movies to younger generations, for example? Um, you know, I, I think storytelling and, and filmmaking, um, you know, is, is always about that. In order to give a story meaning... Uh, it has to relate to us in some way and it has to relate to our experiences or our, our beliefs or our philosophies or our, you know, the way we live our lives. And I think that th there is no film, certainly no good film or even great film that doesn't approach uh, storytelling with that in mind, that there is something um, there, that the film needs to be about something in order for it to be, you know, meaningful to an audience. And this includes also to include a lot of comedy in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, there's a great, uh, yes, uh, I, I'm sure your audience has heard of uh, 
a spoonful of sugar. Um, you know, there's a great <laughs> song from uh, from Mary Poppins written by the Sherman Brothers called "The Spoonful of Sugar." So, comedy, of course, in storytelling is is that sugar, I guess. I would love to retrace the journey of your career as a filmmaker and director. So you enter this magical world uh, at the California Institute of the Arts in the early 80s. Yes. So, uh, you know, I was, I, I was born and raised in Palo Alto, California. And... Um, One of the one of my friends um, who I met probably even before high school was a uh, uh, someone named Kirk Wise who also loved animation, loved to draw, and we both did theater. And so we met doing a show at the Children's Theater in Palo Alto. It was actually, ironically, a, a production of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which is somewhat prophetic. And we got to know each other and discovered that we both liked animation and we'd like to draw. And so we would spend time together. Uh, watching cartoons, drawing, learning how to draw. And uh, and ultimately, we made an animated film together. And one day, he came to me and he said he had just heard of this place called CalArts, or California Institute of the Arts, and they had an animation program, uh, which was founded in, originally by Walt Disney. And so we were both like very excited about the idea that maybe we could go get, you know, start a career in animation. And uh, and like I said, we made a film together, which... which um, because I'm a year older than Kirk, I submitted as uh, in my portfolio, and then I got accepted. And the following year, Kirk got accepted, and then our career sort of went in a parallel path. I, I got hired at Disney uh, before Kirk did, but then he got hired later, and then we worked together. And then eventually, um, Kirk ended up being one of the directors of the movie Beauty and the Beast, uh, and and I directed Lion King. So we had these two incredible um uh, directing experiences but we met uh uh in as you know teenagers i guess in uh, palo alto doing theater um and and the thing that i discovered much later which was kind of shocking to me and I, i'm surprised i never knew it at the time was that uh two very famous disney animators who worked in the golden age with walt disney uh were called frank thomas and ollie johnson And Frank and Ollie actually also met in Palo Alto in the same hometown. I think that they both went to Stanford <laughs> University. Um, and even Ollie may have gone to, to our, actually been a student at our high school, which is mind blowing because if I had known that at the time, it would have been, it would have, it would have been very meaningful, but I didn't find out till much later. In fact, I think I only found out fairly recently um, that Ollie was a student at Palo Alto High School. In definitive, Rob Minkoff, this uh, short film that you made changed your life. And I'm very curious about it. And yeah. uh, w when I'm thinking about it, I can visualize some stop motions, animation, or maybe it was something made on computers. No computers. No, no, no. That, it, back <laughs> then, and we're talking about the late 70s when, when, we, when Kirk and I met, um, there, uh, computers were very early in their development, certainly personal computers. Um, so no, there was, a, so we did everything old fashioned, the old fashioned way. We had uh, paper, punched paper, and we built ourselves a, a kind of animation desk, a light box. Um, we ordered the paper from a company called Cartoon Color, which uh, was famous for uh, being maybe the only store that had animation supplies. Uh, and so we, we actually animated it by hand with drawings. So at the very beginning, you are telling that Robert Minkoff was very manual and uh, very creative, for example, using your hands to, to make some uh, sketches yep. to better uh, create the animation later. Yes. So yeah, like I said, Kirk and I uh, really enjoyed drawing. Uh, and that's how kind of we, we connected as friends. And I, I remember there's actually a book that Kirk had, which he loaned to me, which was an incredible art instruction book by an artist named Andrew Loomis, which was uh, called Fun with a Pencil. And he loaned the book to me and I kept it for several years, <laughs> even though Kirk would say, Where's, can, can I get my book back? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, I, yeah, <laughs> I'll give it back. Don't worry. And I finally, finally, of course, returned the book to Kirk, which was, I think maybe even a, like an original, uh, you know, a, like a first edition copy of the book. It's an incredible book, by the way. It's a great book. And I think it's maybe still in 
print and maybe still available. And then, of course, I bought my own my own book. But it's a terrific book on sort of the fundamental uh, fundamentals of drawing and you know drawing cartoon characters, which is basically just drawing anything in a in an exaggerated way. And a movie in which drawings play a huge role is The Lion King, 88 minutes that shaped the entire world. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible how, how, you know, still the film is, uh, um, you know, has, it's made a huge impact and obviously it's gone on, you know, uh, year after year. Um, you know, it's incredible. I mean, it's not, it was, certainly wasn't expected or, or <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing, especially considering how the film began, you know, because uh, it was a struggle to make and a struggle to, to get people to believe in it. You mean that at the beginning, nobody wanted to see it? Well, <clears throat> what happened was it, it got, it got put into development. There were many projects that, uh, that were put into development at Disney, which meant, uh, you know, uh, people would be hired to, uh, to write or to draw, uh, or visualize or imagine what the stories might be. And Lion King began, uh, as a, as a way of, of retelling, uh, a story like Bambi. Obviously Bambi was very, it was a monumental work done at, you know, at Disney during the heyday of Disney. Um, and so the idea was, to do a kind of Bambi set in Africa. That was the original pitch. And um, it, it really took a long time for the story to evolve. Uh, at, but early on, th there was some skepticism, I think, because the film wasn't based on a well-known fairy tale uh, or other other well-known story. So it was one of, it, it may have been the first Disney animated film to be, um, you know, not, based on some some other you know great work obviously like beauty and the beast very well known story little mermaid aladdin uh all of those things were you know huge uh and and there was a lot of awareness but lion king wasn't in fact the, the original title for lion king was king of the jungle which also may have led people to think that it was it was going to be more of a, a Tarzan story than it was about lions. And then eventually later, uh, when the movie was actually quite close to being finished, the movie got retitled The Lion King. And, um, you know, so very early on, people didn't know what to make of it. And, you know, and, and, it, and it took a long time for the story and everything to gel. So, you know, even the things people were seeing early on may not have indicated, you know, the, the sort of the film that would eventually, uh, you know, turn out. Absolutely. You mean that this is part of the uh, cycle of life at the beginning? Um, nobody be believes in it until a, a team that is working very hard and then the audience uh, is changing everything. Yeah. So that was, you know... <sighs> So one of the interesting things is when you're, you know, working on a, on something like uh, Lion King or any kind of film is if you're doing something that hasn't been done before, you know, there's there's a lot more, in a sense, opportunity, but it also can be more challenging because you're, you know, doing something that hasn't been done and therefore there's no rules uh, uh, about you know, how to, how to make it or what to think of it. Um, whereas in other kinds of stories that are more well known or more well understood, you know, there's sort of, uh, a road, a bit of, more of a roadmap, uh, to, you know, uh, of how to approach the story, uh, because stories that, uh, have st stood the test of time obviously are, are with us for a reason, you know, and the, 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 the elements of the story are powerful and, <clears throat> kind of contain within it, you know, very important lessons like Beauty and the Beast, for instance, you know, we talk about this idea of don't judge a book by its cover, the idea that, uh, you know, she falls in love with someone that looks on the outside like a beast, but on the inside has a has a, a beautiful soul. Um, and so that idea that that's which is embodied in the story has remained uh, with us culturally for for, you know, you know, years and years. And, And, and therefore those, those ideas are, are very powerful and then can be shared again and, and remade. 
Um, and so we were trying to find what that was in Lion King. So, you know, it didn't come with the story in the beginning. We had to kind of figure out what was the, the, the essence of the story that, that could make it universal. And to make it universal, as you just mentioned, Rob Minkoff, there is one song, Akuna Matata. Yes. It's a great song. Um, so <laughs> it, it was interesting. I have to, so there's a story behind that song. So uh, when we were working on the film, you know, we were um, figuring out how to put it together and what to, how to make it. And Elton John and Tim Rice had written a song I mean, we knew where the song was supposed to go. It was basically when Timon and Pumbaa meet Simba and introduce him into their world. And the original song that they wrote was called He's Got It All Worked Out. And it was Timon singing about Pumbaa and how Pumbaa, you know, had figured out the secret of, of life. And the idea of the song was fine. It just somehow didn't quite click. You know, it wasn't quite the right, uh, didn't have quite the right elements. So we were a little bit, frustrated about how to convey the story. And w when we all looked at it, you know, sort of objectively, we said, geez, you know, this, the song, there's so much potential and somehow the song didn't quite ring the bell. Uh, and so we went back to Tim and, and to Elton and, and said, you know, maybe there's another way of, of doing this. And um, the phrase Hakuna Matata um, was something that the Uh, the team who went to Africa uh, uh, on a research trip early on in the in the production uh, picked up, heard people using that ex that phrase, and and they brought it back with them and said, "Oh, this there's this great expression, this phrase Hakuna Matata, which means you know no worries. It's very commonly used." And so Tim heard that and he immediately seized on it. He was like, "Oh, that's I think that's fantastic," uh, and he he likened it to Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, which is a also a great song from Cinderella. <laughs> and so he's like, yeah, you know, it has that kind of, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it stands out and it's sort of unique. And he felt that he could really work with that uh, to create something. And then they came back with the, the, the song as we know today. It was, it was fantastic. It was, it was, uh, it really, it really did what it needed to do. The musicians Elton John, the researchers in Africa, you are definitely, uh, for example, uh, for The Lion King, uh, working with hundreds of people. This is a lot of work because you need to be uh, supervising everything. Uh, yes, I think that at the time we, I remember asking because, you know, you don't really think about how many people work on the film. But when we counted the credits, it was about 600 So uh, there's a lot of people. What I found very amazing is that how some little changes and eureka moment during the making of this movie uh, could change everything and change uh, how the world is perceiving it. Totally. Well, that's, you know, again, I mean, it's, it's a creative process. So you're in the middle of, of making something Uh, that's never been done before. And so you're figuring it out as you go. Uh, and so there are many points along the process where, um, you know, literally the, the piece is transformed when you uh, uh, have a, a successful outcome. You know, for instance, you know, we were, we were writing the characters of Timon and Pumbaa and trying to figure out what their personalities were. And we were listening to auditions for the hyenas And the two actors, Tim, uh, Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella, had had come in to record an audition in New York because they were both performing in the show Guys and Dolls. They knew each other. And so when they saw each other at the audition, they said, oh, that's, you know, it's great that you're here. Let, let's see if we can do our, our audition together. And so they came in and they recorded together doing the hyenas, which was, but they were, they were so funny and their voices just leapt, you know, off of, out of the recorder. And they were so charming and, and, likable really like they were so appealing and we said maybe they would be great as Timon and Pumbaa and then th and then we we started to evolve that the characters are sort of around them and around their personality their personalities and then after the release of this movie what is happening in your life in California 
after the release of the film. Well, uh, uh, you know, I just kept uh, kept working, kept at it. You know, uh, it was interesting actually when we were when the film was released. It was released, I think, in June of 1994, and the studio asked myself and uh, my directing partner Roger Allers to go to Japan. Uh, to do a special screening of the film in Japan. So we were actually in Japan when the film opened in in, uh, the U.S. Um, And we got a call in the middle of the night from Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was running the studio at the time, uh, congratulating us and letting us know that the film had uh, been received very well and, you know, audiences were lining up to see it. And then, Robert Minkoff, you... uh, uh continue the path on making more animated movie, such as uh, Stuart Little, uh, that, in which you are making also another sequel, The Hunted Mansions, The Forbidden Kingdom, and others' movies. Sure. So, you, so it was interesting. So Stuart Little was the, the first film that I directed after uh, leaving Disney and after having done that film. That was a very difficult uh, decision to make actually. But um, but I wanted the opportunity to do live action and uh, the studio was interested in me coming on board uh, this project, Stuart Little. So it was a, a great opportunity to learn um, about how to make a film, you know, uh, not an animated film, but a live action film, uh, where which combined sort of things that I knew about, um, about animation. Um, but it's not really an animated film. It's a live action film. As Stuart Little happened to be uh, done in, in you know in uh, CGI, uh, and that was one of the earlier one of the first examples of combining live action with CGI, um, and uh, you know ultimately the film you know came out well. It was very challenging to make though, uh, especially because we had to shoot the whole film without the lead performance because obviously Stuart Little was not present on the set for any of it. And so we had to shoot the movie without him there. And it was quite challenging, I think, for the cast uh, because they were making a movie where they didn't, you know, they were acting, of course, to to thin air, basically. They weren't getting back a performance. Um, so one of the things that we did, which I think had been done on Roger Rabbit as well, is we had an actor come in. It wasn't Michael J. Fox who did the voice of Stuart Little eventually, but it was another actor, actually a very dear friend of mine named Jim Dugan, uh, who came in and was performing Stuart on the set. And so there would at least be another actor there reading lines with uh, Gina Davis and Hugh Laurie and Jonathan Lipnicki. And and so they could they could relate to, you know, to that. But m- most often they would be talking to nothing, you know, and so it's very challenging. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of doing Stuart Little was very. It seemed very simple, but it was just getting the actors to look in the in the right place, uh, because you would put a mark or something uh, on the set, and you'd say to the actors, "Okay, that red dot is Stuart," and you'd have to look at him. And then <laughs> I would look at the monitor, and I would sort of go, "Geez, you know, it doesn't for some reason." Gina Davis looks like she's looking in one place, and Hugh Laurie looks like he's looking in a different place, and so, you know. When you're doing a, a live action combination film like that uh, with animation, it's super important that the actors are looking in the right place because if they don't, uh, if they're not focused in the right place, you know, if they're looking over here and the, you know the character is somewhere else, you really start to feel something is not right. You know, you may not notice exactly what's wrong, but it just doesn't feel like they're locked on, and that that focus is one of the the things that allows the audience to truly believe that there's something there, you know, that the actor is really seeing, you know, looking in the right spot. Because again, if their focus is somewhere else, it just doesn't feel right. As you mentioned, Stuart Little is made with a technique called a live action. Can you tell us about the difference uh, with a traditional animated movie? Sure. So, you know, the... Um, the biggest difference, you know, in, in between animation and live action is that in live action, you have everyone working together at the same time. Um, in animation, everything is done in pieces. And so you're working with different artists and they finish that piece. Let's say they start with storyboards. They finish that. Then that storyboards goes to layout. Then the layout artists draw it again 
as a layout, meaning they plan the, the camera movements, they draw the actual backgrounds, and then that goes to the animator. The animator then starts to bring the character to life within that set. And then eventually that goes to a cleanup artist, and then it goes into ink and paint and gets colored, and then it gets combined. So there's many artists working in succession, whereas in live action, uh, once you're on the set, you have everyone there, the cinematographer, the actors, uh, the wardrobe, you've got uh, the set props people, you've, uh, you've got a whole giant army of people, uh, and you're filming sort of everything simultaneously. So that that's really the, the, the biggest difference. What's similar is that every movie starts with a screenplay. Um, and then you go through pre-production, which is you design everything, and you're working with artists designing. Uh, in live action, they're designing the sets and the costumes. Um, and in animation, obviously, they're designing everything, including the characters. So um, all of those early phases are exactly the same. Uh, and then everything at the end is the same. So once the film is finished and cut together, you score the film with a composer. That's exactly the same. You sit on the stage and listen to the, uh, as the orchestra plays against the scenes, and then eventually you'll take that into a mix and you'll put all the pieces together and all the sound and uh, uh, visuals and combine it all together and ultimately uh, blend it. Um, so those, that's the same. So really it's that part in the middle uh, and the you know the way I like to describe it to, to people because it's very clear is that when uh, uh, an, you listen to an orchestra, you have a conductor and the conductor conducts you know the hundred pieces of a uh, hundred players at the same time and you hear the music in animation. Imagine doing it exactly the same way, but you're recording one instrument at a time. And so the instrumentalist doesn't necessarily have the benefit of hearing everything at the same time, and yet has to do a performance that will blend and fit with everything. And so the director's role in an animated film is to make sure each artist understands how what they're doing is going to fit into the whole. You mean that because live action is a chaos sometimes, you have to be on the set every time to make sure that everything is working. Yes, but you but when all the pieces are working, you see them all put together at the same time. And so you say, yes, everything everything has been coordinated. It all works together. You obviously you shoot the, the take, and then once you've got uh, once you've got the shot, you can move on to your next shot. In animation, you're just creating it one little piece at a time. And when I'm, for example, watching some making ofs uh, footage, I can see that there are uh, blue screens, for example, some captures that we can put on uh, actors' clothes. Yes, I mean it depends on on uh, you know what kind of a sequence you may be shooting. If it's vi is a visual effect sequence and you have an actor against a blue screen, and now there's new techniques uh, for doing that. Even uh, it's very interesting to look at uh, the Mandalorian, for instance, and see what they're doing with these uh, these LED walls, where they actually can project uh, the backgrounds of the characters and the lighting from the wall actually uh, impacts the character. That's always a very big challenge. Uh, when you're working on a blue screen or green screen, because the the light, the color is the only thing that reflects on the characters. And so what happens in reality, obviously, is characters are affected by their environment. And, um, and so actually being able to project the environment onto the uh, wall and have that reflected on the actor means that it actually looks more, more seamless. And it's, uh, it doesn't require all those extra, um, effects, elements in order to blend it. And through the decades, there is an evolution uh, concerning, for example, the aspect ratio of the screen. For example, Netflix is using two on one. And uh, uh, I am also going to try this, uh, this aspect ratio. How do you see this evolution? Uh, the evolution of aspect ratios? Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, you know, it's interesting. When when film started, the, the, the aspect ratio was rather square. Um, and then, you know, uh, they started to, you know, widen the image to create a more of a landscape. Um, and this became very popular uh, after the advent of television, where television screens at the beginning were also square. And so in order to give the audience something different for a, for a theatrical uh, film, uh, they started to 
widen the frame and widen the frame. And, and so uh, throughout the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, you know, you saw those aspect, aspect ratios evolve. And, you know, now we live in a in a time where you can do many different aspect ratios. There's, there's many different available. Uh, so it's not uniform. It's not one thing, you know, so, so th sometimes that becomes a very important choice that you make at the beginning of a production, which is what is the aspect ratio for this particular film? Rob Minkoff, I'm wishing you the best on every type of screens. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>